Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone and welcome to the June webinar for the Merlin Research Project. Uh, we are fortunate today to have Joshua Reut as our guest speaker, a senior conservationist with the Nature Conservancy in Maine, assistant to the Nature Conservancy in Europe and the World Fish Migration Foundation. Uh, Joshua Reut is a landscape ecologist who is bringing the science of large forested landscapes and river networks to planning strategies, monitoring impacts, and identifying priorities for conservation and restoration. His work includes facilitating a diversity of partnerships involved with planning and implementing conservation actions at scales ranging from broad ecoregions down to the specific site. He has led and worked to restore river connectivity in the state of Maine in the United States, opening some of the region's best habitat to native fish and other wildlife. The presentation today, uh, uh, he will present on the planning process to lead to the development of a river restoration strategy and many of the enabling conditions needed to take such blue sky ideas to a functioning system for freeing rivers in the state of Maine, in the United States and beyond. So a key question will be, we have many great strategies, how to make them actionable by removing barriers and creating enabling conditions. The format, in case this is your first time, it's about roughly 20 to 25 minutes of presentation. Again, after that 20 to 25 minutes for questions. Uh, we are going to try to take questions. If you will raise your hand, if you will use the button in the lower right, of your screen, the screen that says reaction, there is a raise hand button. Uh, but if, for instance, you have to leave and would like to leave a question, you can put it in the chat. Uh, all of this is being recorded uh, right now so that you can see the questions and responses later if uh, you cannot see the entire program today. So with that, uh, Joshua Wright, thank you so much for joining us at such a great distance. We're very, very uh, pleased that you could join us. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Jan, so much. And thanks um, to the whole Merlin committee who puts this together. I know it's difficult to put together presentations and get all the people. It's a great crowd, um, so I appreciate it. So I'm gonna share my screen now. This is a, um, a rapid fire presentation. It's meant to be a sampler of all the different types of things that came together to make this work possible in Maine and uh, gives us hope for scaling up. But we have some of the same challenges that you will probably have um, as well with Europe. Um, and, and I'm excited to, to see us both meet these challenges. So first, let me start with um, a little background. <clears throat> um, so I work for the Nature Conservancy and here's our mission to, um, uh, sorry, I've got a view problem. There we go. There we go. So you can see um, our mission uh, is to conserve the lands and waters, which all life depends on. We work in 76 countries now around the world. Um, most of our offices are in the US where we have offices in each state. Um, the, our major emphasis has been on land protection. Water protection came a little bit later, around 2000 or so we started our prioritization processes for restoring freshwaters and marine areas. And now we're working on, on a great deal of restoration around the world. Um, state of Maine, just for context, is in the northeastern corner of the US. It's about the same size as Portugal, a little smaller than, uh, sorry, it's got, these, uh, got the hungry square kilometers wrong, but you can see we're roughly the size of Portugal. We've got mountains that are uh, like Mount Katahdin in the north. Uh, beautiful alpine summits. Um, a lot of our habitat is uh, coniferous forest, but it goes down to deciduous forest. So somewhat of the range from Southern Germany to central Sweden in terms of climate zones. Lots of lakes from this glacially scoured habitat, some unique species like for us, the uh, Arctic char found in the 48 states only in the state of Maine. A lot of peatlands um, also of interest to the uh, Merlin group. Uh, floodplain forest, coastal habitats, a lot of rocky coastline, uh, thousands of islands, which all form a context for 
not just the wildlife that we have around the state from large uh, wide ranging mammals and fish to uh, the people that have lived with these species for um, signs of at least 8,000 years of human habitation in the state of Maine. But of course, colonization had a huge impact on how sustainable these resources have been in the future and what we do with them. So again, the state of Maine, it's about 85% forested, one of the most forested by percentage uh, states in the union. And 22% uh, of that is protected, some in sort of what we call a gap one, gap two status, um, non-extractive, and then the lighter green is the extractive. And what I love about our freshwater work is it connects the forest work that we've done, land protection over um, 5,000, uh, sorry, two, 120,000 hectares, converting in my head, um, but it brings together those forest lands which support the rivers, which support our marine environment, our marine fisheries um, historically did have a very close connection with these sea run fish coming out of our rivers. And we do this work in the lens of climate change and the lens of energy and of sharing and collecting um, to inspire others. So everybody knows this story. We've lost a lot of our species since 1970. And what I like to do is look back at our data for harvesting. So here for American Shad and River Herring, our two our clupeids, three species actually, in the Northeast. And you can see the decline from the 50s. This looks very familiar. But what we forget is that when we look further back um, to the 1800s, um, we've got this shifting baseline, which a lot of people are familiar with, where huge amounts of fish were already lost by the time the very first fisheries commission reports were written in the 1890s. And then when you look further down the line towards the current declines, you can see what we're declining from. So a decline from a decline from a decline. So the major factors that we work with in Maine are blocked access to habitat, whether it's floodplains or headwaters where most of the habitat is in headwater, smaller streams. Um, it's about 85% in our fairly moist habitat here that is headwaters that are, those are streams that would be crossed by a, a culvert rather than a bridge. Um, so that's a lot of habitat up there in the headwaters. And if we don't connect them, we're really having these large corridors without having connections to the bedrooms and the bathrooms, uh, if you will. And it's not just unique to Maine, of course, this is globally, and there's this huge pending threat. I hope this slide is familiar. It was in the Sea to Source book, as well as several other publications, Gunter Grill and others, but looking at where the biodiversity in the world is and where dams are planned with the little red and orange dots. And you can see there's a huge problem for biodiversity in these developing parts of the world. It's not just up and downstream, it's to the floodplains. I don't need to tell this group that. If you have any questions of any of these slides, again, I know they're going quick. Put a little note on your notepad or, or type it into your phone or whatever, and we'll come back to them. But I assume a lot of these theories are pretty familiar. So to figure out where to work, we did an assessment in the Northeast of 30,000 dams in the region and ranked them for migratory fish as well as upstream native fish, these headwater habitats, and found that Maine has a great deal of potential with the red dots for both sea run and uh, interior fish. And one of the best places to work was the Penobscot River. If you can look at this chart of bars, <clears throat> the watershed size is on the, the black line going up to the right, and the number of dams are represented by the blue bars. So you can see for a fairly large basin size, the Penobscot has very few dams. So it was a neat opportunity to work. And of course, it's not just about stream kilometers, it's also about these amazing species of fish. We have 12 species of fish um, that go up and down our rivers through every season of the year. Um, some of them by the tens and hundreds, uh, hundreds and thousands. Uh, when you get up to salmon, uh, hopefully in the thousands, we're not always there. And then for the millions when it comes to the river herring. And there's also all these other species that depend on these e ecosystems from the land um, and the riparian zones in the stream and stream beds and out into the marine environment where again, there's this close connection and has been historically. And as I mentioned, it's not just um, ecological, there's very real cultural connections to these ecosystems that have been in place for thousands of years. So just real quick, I'm not gonna go through the bullets on the slide, I'm happy to refer to it later, but just for a rough idea of the size, 
for the Penobscot watershed, 22,000 square kilometers. It's our largest watershed in the state. Um, and there are about 150 dams in it. And we're gonna focus in this area in the yellow rectangle. Where we looked at this balance of how many uh, barriers can you pass fish through um, with fish ladders or fish lifts or nature-like bypasses and get them to their spawning habitat. And we know that it degrades the more barriers you have, the fewer fish make it to the spawning habitat upstream. Maybe it's not spawning, maybe it's rearing habitat for um, American eel or European eel. So even the best state-of-the-art fish passage is only partially capable of passing fish. And so as we look at different options, for instance, if there was dams on three different tributaries, but only one dam per tributary, you're still only getting 50% of the fish making it to their habitat. That's better than the 12.5%. But then if you took all those dams and put them on one of the tributaries and left the others free, you get many more fish making to the habitat. And that's exactly what we did with this balancing system where we increased energy to the dams that are represented in green blocks on the left and added fish passage to the dams on the right side in the blue blocks, including the removal of two of the dams closest to the ocean, Great Works and VZ Dam. And this is gonna increase habitat to over 3,200 kilometers of the river. Um, so this is the largest uh, run of Atlantic salmon. This is sort of the before after. I'll go back and forth a couple of times. What was accessible and what is now accessible with passage of dams. So it started with the removal of Great Works Dam, which happened on my 50th birthday in 2012. And um, it was open up the, uh, the second to the lowest dam, this before and after was followed a year later by the VZ Dam removal. Also before and after pictures. I'll go back and forth, toggle a little bit. And from the aerial view, you can see it's a rather large river. There's the standard sort of powerhouse on the left, this beautiful old brick building. Um, and there is all that stuff gone. We tried to get someone to adopt that beautiful brick building, but no one would. We were thinking it'd be a great brew pub, but no takers. In any case, here's an aerial photo I took uh, that following fall. There's still a long dam going up the middle of the river that's falling apart. And we decided that that was not a barrier to fish passage, but actually provided some unique habitat as it's degraded. The Milford uh, Fishway was added. It's a, it's a ladder and a lift in that far right corner. There's a decent attraction flow there, not ideal. And at Howland, uh, the dam is in the middle of the village. You can see the um, traffic circle and a boat launch. Getting rid of this dam caused a lot of um, stress for the town. And without their support, we would not be able to do the entire project and get the funding. Half of the funding was federal funding. We wouldn't be able to get that without the buy-in from the town. So we came up with a nature-like fishway. Here's the diagram. Here's what it looks like um, in real life. Uh, a couple of years ago, just greened up. But you can see there's a lot of options for fish passing at different stages of water levels, which is crucially important. We found fish do not hesitate to go up there and no juveniles are killed coming downstream. Um, this is during the construction phase, just to give you an idea of the scale. And the energy was transferred from dams without turbines, uh, sorry, dams with turbines to dams that didn't have turbines, um, as well as dams outside the system where improvements could be made with the generation. And all together, this energy, we make a big deal about it, but it's only 3% of the wind energy generation that's been developed in just the last decade in Maine. And solar is quickly coming up to speed as far as our capacity. These are megawatt hours, so we need to, sorry, megawatts, the potential capacity. And we found that with solar and wind, we're getting around 28, maybe 30% uh, efficiency and for these big old hydro power plants, it's more like 23 to 25% efficiency. So dam removal is a major strategy, of course, and um, that's what we, uh, we added the Penobscot to this mix, um, but it's not the full picture because of course there are also these culverts and I mentioned all the headwater habitat, about 85% of the habitat is in uh, headwaters is, is in these uh, streams that could be blocked by culverts. So realizing there was a gap in our data for the state of Maine, we got a crew out and every place there was a line in GIS and a road in GIS. 
which isn't perfect. It's like 80% perfect. Uh, this crew went out and surveyed these sites and documented the structural size and their capacity, the plunge pool, the habitat up and downstream. And one of the things we found is that a lot of these culverts that were problems for habitat were also problems for people. We thought maybe there was a 50-50 overlap, but it's a lot more than that. So almost all the culverts that are bad for people are bad for the ecosystems um, and their failure ca causes a safety problem at the site stranding people, they could be caught, they could be washed away. There's detour costs, which is time, which is also money if you're hauling wood or if you're school kids getting to school or a hospital. There's the ecological damages causes and the emergency costs of doing construction under duress, which is a lot more expensive than planned ahead of time. So we needed a multifaceted solution. And I think these are the types of solutions being looked at in Europe right now and that Merlin is looking at and that Amber looked at before, but it has to do with where is the habitat? Where is the habitat blocked because of barriers? Analysis tools to help us focus our work more effectively, funding mechanisms, policies so that it's easier to fix these problems, even if there's temporary environmental damage, but if there's long-term gain, then it's probably worthwhile. Freshwater systems are used to um, occasional trauma and, and, and disasters and they recover quickly. To get this work done, we really need education and outreach. And this is a big gap that I see coming down the road, even with funding. And we need, of course, to get the projects implemented, which means capable project managers. So first there's the barrier data. Here's our little chicken pox all across the state of Maine. Red ones are bad, orange ones are probably bad, but need more sophisticated analysis. And the green ones are good. Uh, here's just a, what those crossings look like, an awful lot of them are orange, those culverts, 45%, are culverts, and then there's multiple culverts, which are almost always a problem. It's another 13%. And we know that about half of those culverts will not pass fish or ecological flows. We also need the habitat data to marry together with the barrier and streamline data so we can get not just kilometers and kilometers potentially opened, but know which species it's gonna be benefiting and whether those are rare species, whether they're sea run fishy, uh, fish or whether they're common species that um, we want to make sure stay common into the future as climate changes and all these habitats become that's much more at risk. And we put these together in prioritization tools. This is fairly rudimentary, but we're working on improving it. One of the things that the Nature Conservancy in Europe is doing um, with partners there is trying to develop more sophisticated tools for prioritization as well as optimization and better cost estimates and better risk estimates. And then there's implementing, which takes time and skill. You need to understand the materials. You need to have uh, backhoe operators who know how to run equipment and what a natural stream gradient and width should be based on the hydrology and expected um, weather events. And also um, making sure that maybe you have passage for species through the culverts. So if you're a mink or an otter, if you're um, even deer, we've seen move through these in coyotes. So when you have a big structure with banks built into it, it allows for the flexibility of the stream and at least low water passage. Um, so we've got the large dam removal. We've got fish passage projects like this fish ladder, a steep pass at Pusha, which lets about a million fish up each year and culvert projects like the Pass of Dumkeg, culvert replacement for, for a small town project. And we need to monitor. So we've got all sorts of monitoring that's been happening from fish behavior. You can see there's published papers on a lot of this work. The changes in geomorphology weren't that great because these were run of river projects and a lot of the sediment would wash through with big storms. But we did learn a lot about fish passage and what works and what doesn't. We learned a lot about the ecology of sea lamprey and how they improve the stream beds. We learned a lot about how people appreciate a free-flowing river versus an impounded one. Some people don't like it, some people do. We, we learned that, um, that it's a healthier system if it's free-flowing as far as um, oxygen and water quality. And we also know that the bird life improves around as far as uh, piscivores, uh, such as eagles and osprey. Um, and here, here's all the fish um, just about. We've got two river herring species. We've got the shad species, the alosa. We've got Atlantic salmon, sea lamprey in this. And, and just last week, this was the shot in the fishway at Milford. 
is full of sea lamprey, which is fantastic. We're, we're just about two and a half million fish have made it up the river so far this year, which is exciting. And we know we can track the nutrients through stable isotope work and eDNA and also stomach content of where the nutrients from these, this new abundance, these millions of fish are going. Millions of adult fish, I should say, but billions of juvenile fish coming out from these rivers every year like clockwork into the Gulf of Maine. So the ecological response, many have seen this, these slides before, I think, but there's an impact on the sea run fish themselves, the bird life, the native fish in the river have benefited from the nutrient exchange. Marine life and the river herring have gone up from few thousands uh, before the restoration in 2012, remember? So 2013 was the first year where we got into the tens of thousands and now we're into the millions. Um, we do know there are delays. Fish come up to Great uh, the Milford Dam, which is the, the line at the top, and they stay there for days. You can see from 518, sorry for the reverse dates, from May 18th to May uh, 30th to June 1st, these fish were swimming around below this really good, effective, we thought, fish lift, but there are delays. Um, there are also uh, differences in the size of the fish old pass. We're finding that we're favoring smaller fish. Smaller fish have fewer eggs, fewer offspring, so that's a problem over the long run. And there's also a compounded interest on mortality of juveniles coming out of the stream. The more dams they pass, the worse they fare as they transition into the ocean. It's also um, noteworthy that American eel survivorship changes dramatically with and without dams. We knew that, but also with the flows at the dams. So these studies have really helped us understand more about the ecology as well as how restoration works. We have some economic response. I'm sorry, this is in dollars, but dollars are pretty close to euros these days. Um, but for some small towns, this is about you know, 10% of their annual budget that they get from harvest at, at uh, some of the sites on the Kennebec. Um, there's resources available for food relief in Haiti, um, as well as for lobster bait, our foremost economic driver for marine fisheries. And there's also strong social response from restoring treaty rights to our indigenous Penobscot people, as well as healthier food source. And um, fishing has increased, boating has increased, and there's community parks that have developed where each of these former dam sites were. I mentioned policies before, and we definitely need policies that um, make it easier to implement these projects um, correctly than to do them poorly or to create barriers. So we, we worked on getting fast tracking for federal permits as well as state permits with improved guidelines that are specific to restoration. So for instance, before getting a, a, a tractor, a backhoe, um, into a stream was a big no-no. It's something that we would try to avoid. And now we've learned that if you spend weeks and weeks and weeks on your project with the chance of big storms coming in, with the chance of droughts coming in, it's much more impactful than if you went in, got your equipment in the stream, pulled out the barriers and were out in two days for some of these small dams, than if it went on and on forever. Other sites we need to be more careful of. Um, and it's critically important to make sure there aren't fish being harmed in the way, especially our federally listed species. So we've adapted those federal rules on endangered species. Um, we're looking at um, better simulate stream simulations so that we can get uh, designs more appropriate to the current weather patterns, um, new rules for road crossings, um, and also um, getting money from the insurance agencies to do what they call pre-disaster. You gotta love these terms. It's a pre-disaster funding. So rather than paying a lot more for that emergency restoration of a culvert, you're predicting that it's gonna be failing with the current storms that we're already having and providing funding to help upgrade those in the mean term. So we've got funding coming in. Also, this is under policy. We've got funding with our infrastructure uh, act uh, and that is bringing um, over a billion dollars to river restoration across the U.S. And that'll, uh, a lot of that will go to things like culverts and dam removals. Um, I'm noticing also that our education and outreach is having a good impact in, in terms of people around the state understanding this problem. We've had workshops for town planners, workshop for engineers and consultant companies, workshops for the agencies from 
the state agencies, the federal agencies, local planning boards. Um, also, they better understand what a fish friendly passage looks like and how much of a problem it is and some of the things they can do and even some of the funding that they could access if they get some outside resources to help. What we found, and this is a problem that's not just in the US, it's a problem in Europe as well, is that there are not necessarily the partners who can put together these massive grant applications, track the funding, um, deal with the reporting, um, and, and, and also find the contractors to do these projects in short order. We need, we need to learn like the highway people have that you need to get your contract bids out maybe a year ahead of time to get the better prices. If you're doing it you know, four months before the project is gonna start because that's when you got the funding, you're gonna have very high prices for contracting. So educating people, getting them aware of the problems, getting more capable project managers on board is crucial for getting this work done. And I don't know how to do this, so I could use some help from others, both in the US and in Europe, but how do we get more engineering students coming out of school with this basic ecological background? So education and outreach are not just those classes, but also celebrating successes, problem solving. These are all from World Fish Migration Day events, which is something that we use every two years, the even numbered years that the World Fish Migration Foundation um, supports. Um, in the upper left is with, with our Senator from the state of Maine and our, some of our major trustees, workshops with regulators and, and actual on the ground projects. Um, I don't need to, to sell World Fish Migration Day or the foundation work to this crew probably, but just so we know that, you know, putting books out, it's now translated into uh, Mandarin Chinese, the Living Planet Index, the Swimways Project, and um, all of this is boosted by having a really strong regular pulse of press, of media, and that grows uh, from World Fish Migration Day as well as a lot of other events. So I can't overemphasize how, emphasize how important it is for us experts to get our information out to people. So here are some of the systemic solutions to the river barrier problem is understanding where those barriers are, the impacts they're having on how much habitat and what kind of habitat for what species, ways to prioritize these that suit the user. Whether you're a, a small town and you just have two or three of these barriers, knowing which one is the most important it, it is really helpful. But if you've got a basin management plan, then you a river basin management plan, then you really want maybe some optimization models if it's a large basin to figure out which clusters of barriers would work. Um, but then there's that education and outreach in order to get people to want their project removed. Um, there's the policy I mentioned, as well as the funding. Um, different funding sources will suit different end users, whether it's for construction or the scientists around it or the communities that you want to buy in on this. There's often an, a lot of uh, enabling work that's needed to get communities to understand they have a problem in town and understand that it's not gonna look terrible when they're done. That's a big concern. Um, we often hear that this project is gonna result in it being a stinking mud hole when you're done. And if there's water flowing down now, there'll probably be water flowing down later. And that's something that I think um, having that imagery, having artists, having photo simulations of what this could look like after is crucially important and having lots and lots of listening sessions to understand their concerns because there may be things that we don't understand regarding um, water out, uh, extraction for agriculture, boating uses, um, sauna uses in Finland. Uh, so what are the other ways that people appreciate the impoundment? It's good to understand that ahead of time because you might be able to solve them with some pretty low cost solutions compared to dam removal. And we need to measure the impact and result and, and re get these results out um, from fish numbers, which are always exciting to understanding people's impressions of it. There's still challenges. There's, a, as I mentioned, there's attachment to local structures. There's a lack of knowledge that's motivation. I always like to quote uh, from the little prince, Antoine Saint-Exupéry, to get people to build boats, you can teach them about construction, you can teach them about building and, and uh, architecture, or you can start by inspiring them to love the ocean and travel. Um, so that wasn't a direct quote, but you get the idea. We need to inspire people that a free flowing river could be beneficial to them, the people upstream and downstream, the ecosystems. And I think we have better rules in Europe um, than most places in the world to bring the um, 
the legal backing to help with that. Um, we don't have good floodplain uh, and flood risk models developed to figure out where these structures, removal of the structures could create problems or where we could create solutions by removing uh, uh, those uh, long latitudinal barriers, sorry, into floodplains. So if we can get better at identifying those, I think we can do better at uh, getting those floodplains to flood again and getting the vegetation and fauna back. And we also need better ideas of the long-term cost and revenues. So that's my presentation and I'm happy to answer any questions. I've got in just around that 20 to 25 minute point, um, but I'm all ears and I haven't checked the chat. So uh, Jan or others, if you can um, feel free. <laughs> Thanks for the applauses, the virtual applauses. Um, I'm, I'm happy to answer questions or go back to a slide if that's helpful. Thank you very much, Joshua, for a very clear presentation, beautiful pictures. Um, I have not seen any questions uh, in the chat. Um, wait, I do see one, but I, I just saw a hand appear. Uh, please use uh, down in the lower corner, if you'd like to just uh, ask a question directly, uh, raise your hand and I should see it come to the upper left-hand corner of my monitor. So right. that hand I'll disappeared and I, see Sebastian's, I see Sebastian's message in the chat. And, right. and this is helpful. Yeah, this is helpful. So it's also something that I hear people say in Finland. It's just like the Finns have great environment. They love their rivers. Um, I know from our Mongolia program as well, we don't need to convince them to love their rivers um, and that they're important. We need to show them sort of the economics that are involved, long-term, short-term. Um, and that's difficult. Um, so it does look nearly natural with all that forest, but there's a lot of development and a lot of our roads parallel our rivers. And a lot of our rivers have been used uh, um, intensively over time um, with, um, I just missed the question, but there it is. I think, um, I think having a bond to nature in the state, people come to Maine for the nature is helpful. Um, and they, they love fishing and hunting, and I think that's helpful. Um, but when it comes to costs, there's only so much, especially a small town can do. So our road networks, for instance, and I'm talking a lot about those rather than the dams, I'll get to dams in a minute. Um, they're, they're only about half of those are, are state roads and the state can only do so many each year. So we look at their three-year plans and prioritize, and that's easier for the towns. Our towns are largely poor and doing one good project might be their whole road budget for a year. And there's plenty of other emergencies coming up. So we need to help them prioritize and we need to help them apply, understand that there's outside funding and apply for that because they don't have the resources. Just like uh, many of the small NGOs, for instance, in Europe that applied for Open Rivers program, they didn't even have the resources to pull together their project information, their background, um, to check the language, to get the, uh, to pull the application together. So we need to help people to help themselves. Um, and I think that, um, I think these can be replicated in more intensive uh, agriculture, as you mentioned, uh, Sebastian areas. Um, again, if we can reconnect people to those natural areas. And I think it's not a hard sell. I think people uh, go to water to calm their nerves. They go to water to seek you know, to go for their walks, to eat their lunch. Uh, I think what we need to do is bring it to the economics and practical value and find sources of funding to help them do better work than they would otherwise. And I think that funding is coming online through the EU. So I'm hoping that's possible, but let's not underestimate the value of that outreach and education and inspiration. We need to inspire these farmers um, for what they could have, that they could be fishing, that they could have healthier waters, that they couldn't, it might not, you know, smell bad from algae blooms and, and have blue-green algae toxicity problems if it was free-flowing. So it, I think we need to double down on taking our great information and, and turning it into communication. Um, shout if, if, uh, if there's still something lingering oh, there. There's a, a, two more questions now in the chat from Esther Common. She says, yeah. I'm or if you can see it, I'll just I can, say that, yeah. Yeah, I'm interested in your point about pre-disaster funding from insurance. Was this something new that arose through your work or already in place? It arose during our work. 
and we were able to see it in other parts of the country, other states. And uh, luckily we had uh, great people on our staff who understood that this could be applied in the state of Maine. And we actually needed a change of staff at the regulation, the, the, the emergency regulation folks in Maine in order to understand that they could use this funding mechanism. So it took a little, it took education and patience and listening to understand how we could develop a system where pre-disaster funding could come in to use. Um, and it took a while for us to find a good couple of case study sort of applications to use it that would be successful and that we could make a really big deal about. Because once people get word of this opportunity, they're much more likely to want to seek it out themselves. If, if they haven't seen it in action with a comparable town or state project, then they're less likely to want to do it. So I think, um, you know, doing the economics on this is pretty simple. You look at where there have been disastrous blowouts of culverts or disastrous blowout of a dam and um, what it took to fix that situation and understanding the long-term environmental damage. Um, I think that makes for a pretty strong argument of why to try to fix things before the disasters come. Uh, there is a, a follow-up. Uh, uh, Daniel Herring has asked, what do you think are the main needs for training on the job to get such projects done with the current water management staff? So this is difficult because of my lack of understanding of what exists in the, all the different European countries um, in terms of their capacity. But um, I think what's missing is the understanding of dealing with, um, so, so people who do contracting understand big budget projects. I think that's what we have going for us there. I think what's often not understood are the materials and the uh, technical solutions for dam removal, fish passage, and road stream crossings. And that's where I feel like we need, um, we need contractors who understand that better. We need people who can assemble groups of projects together because many of these projects might start, but then stall because of local resistance, because of funding problems, some of the environmental problem that's discovered like um, sediments that need to be managed more carefully. Um, projects start and stop a lot. And sometimes they take three or four or five, needing up to 10 years before they even are able to start. So what we need are project managers who can float a series of projects all at the same time and have funding sources which our, um, our Maliseet uh, nation calls patient money. I love that term. Money that is there for the project, but that can wait until everything comes together. Um, so knowing that it could take a while, um, you know, I wouldn't ask for 10 years for funding to wait around, but five years. And if there are more projects bundled together, there's more opportunity for projects to accelerate and decelerate for other projects to come in and also for you to be able to invest those funds in the meantime or have them still in an investment mechanism while the projects are waiting to happen, but have it be very fluid. So the training needs to be with project management, assembling lots of projects at once, dealing with local um, attitudes. Um, how do we come into a community, start listening very carefully before we even suggest barrier removal learn what the implications are, learn if they're local champions. So we need people who know sort of the social science side of it. Um, that isn't me. And yet I have a great appreciation for those who do go in and understand and take the time to find out that, you know, maybe just having a series of park benches and uh, stone steps going down to the water would be a great solution for the town. Um, whereas otherwise they feel like they're just having something taken away and nothing given back from their dam removal. Um, so other training that's needed are for the survey work. Um, we need to know the data. We need to know where the barriers are. Many of them are obscure. Many are very old and we need to understand the habitat better and where our species would and should get to and where there are species that shouldn't get there because we need to understand how to manage invasive species spreading through these systems as well. I, I wanted to take my prerogative as moderator to follow up in adaptive management, uh, one way we try as scientists coming into a community to humble ourselves is to say nobody really has the answer to the future. We have to kind of learn our way, and that's going to take experiments. Do you? I, you've been quite clear in saying we couldn't move forward unless we showed that economically it was viable. 
But have you ever tried that of just trying to say, look, without these experiments, we're not going to figure out how to live with the increasing uncertainty, you know, we have from things like climate change. Whew. Yeah, absolutely. And what's helpful, um, even though it's, it's um, often tragic, is we have a lot of examples to point to from other places. We have plenty of examples of people drowning behind dams, of cars getting swept downstream across roads, people getting stranded, um, the cost, the environmental damage. But we're not always good at documenting those poor case studies because we learn from stories, right? We are, we are, our brains are built to learn through stories. So how can we catalog those stories better and understand a few levels deeper than the, the headline story, but what are those economic and ecological and other social costs from the disasters that we're trying to avoid, but also of the benefits that we're trying to, to show and reap as well. So planning for the unknown is difficult, but I feel like more and more we have, um, like it or not, we have more and more examples of how things can go wrong and we can share those. Um, but I think things like, uh, Jan, I had mentioned the photo simulation. We had done that for the projects in the Penobscot and that was really helpful for people to see it. Um, the other thing is if they believe what they're seeing, right? I mean, we have this problem with information these days. So can we make um, representations of what the river will look like with rapids and flows and currents and birds and bugs um, that are going to be believable? And um, uh, that, that, that's a whole nother social science experiment that I am not qualified to talk about. <laughs> yeah, how do we get people to, to understand the information and, and believe in it um, before they can be inspired. So it, uh, just to, uh, to complete it, uh, what we have been talking about here in Europe is that unless we open the dikes and allow rivers to flood, we may not figure out how to develop an economy on rivers that can deal with increased uncertainty about drought and flood going back and forth. So we don't know what agriculture is viable until we start flooding the floodplain, you know, with a more natural rhythm, we have to we have to take the risk of opening the dikes in order to find that out. Uh, even the simulations are suspect, but uh, that's a trying yeah. to rally people. You know, we don't have the proof. You know, so that's part of the problem. Um, it would be, it, we do have some examples of floodplain flooding in the U.S. Um, we just opened up. Um, uh, let's see. It was about a kilometer and a half of floodplain to flooding uh, on the Missouri River that our colleagues, uh, TNC in Missouri, the state of Missouri, just did a few summers ago. So we're looking, and you're right, it's not very predictable. Um, there are areas where the sediment gets moved around, and sediment movements are really difficult to predict. Um, so some lands are higher, some are lower. Um, in the Sacramento River Delta area in California, we purchased farming rights that alternate from one area to another so that we can allow certain floodplain areas to flood certain years and then they can close them off other years to have their crops grow. So it's a, a spreading the risk along multiple landowners that we pay for. So we raise money to help pay for uh, them accepting that level of risk. And also that every, you know, every three years, they're gonna have two years where they can't grow their crops. It's gonna be duck and, and, and uh, groundwater infiltration instead. Um, and I think they've accepted that with the cash benefits. All of a sudden they see the greater benefits and some of them are you know, willing to do that for free just about because they see the long-term benefits when their crops are more fertile the years after. I think you know, humans have a long history of farming and floodplains for a good reason and it doesn't take too much to point people back to that. Uh, there's a question here that actually follows up to what you were talking about from Leonard Sandin of Neva. Do people feel they lose something with dam removals in terms of how they think the landscape should look like? It, for example, loss of water mirrors. Yeah, that's a great point. And it comes right to my hometown in Yarmouth, Maine, where there's a beautiful old mill building with a clock tower. And when you cross over <clears throat> Route 1, our, our coastal highway in the US, when you cross over Route 1, you look out and you see the mill reflected in the pond. Um, and people feel that that's part of their history they're gonna lose. And what they didn't realize is that there's ledge there also, that's why they built the dam there. And when we drained the impoundment down, um, we had people lining the river to take measurements and pictures. And 
turned into a non-event. It was nothing really exciting because everything was almost the same. The water was two feet down, which wasn't a big deal. There was still a an impoundment of sorts. Um, in some places there might not be, but um, Leonard, you're absolutely right. People get really attached to these. Um, we're learning how important um, the sense of place is for people's well-being, for their sense of home and belonging and community. And that's exactly what we need to be careful of when we move into some place. And that's a good reason to try things like um, temporary, uh, uh, not withdrawals, but uh, uh, dewatering to see what the stream profile will look like. <clears throat> of course, you're gonna see the mud there for a year until it greens up, but they, they always green up quickly because most of the plants going along rivers are used to being moved around by rivers. So um, the greening up happens quickly, but I think that's, again, delving into some social science in some ways, and yet we're all human, we understand this, but we need to understand people's attachments. Um, in my town, one of, the, one of the reasons, the other reasons was that many people had courted along the river where the dam is because it was a, this fake waterfall that they were, you know, was romantic or whatever, a beautiful part of their town. And so a lot of people felt like we were taking that away. And yet when we did the drawdown, there are actually some beautiful rapids that I think people appreciate as well as um, understanding the fish are running there then. And so again, I think we need some social scientists and artists and, um, and musicians and others to help us along as we try to envision what the future could look like and make that appealing to people. Uh, we only have 10 minutes. I'm, uh, uh, I'm going to skip to Isabel, and then if we have time, go back to Sebastian's question. Isabel writes, in Mozambique, we have a few dams, and we need more to secure water for drinking purposes, energy, and agriculture, as the river's uh, dynamics are very irregular. How to consider fish problems, as we usually take that opportunity for aquaculture. So for us, it is not yet a problem of fish passing, but increased fish production as a secondary effect of impoundment for vital uses. Any advice on how to take into a consideration to avoid problems in the future would help. This is a huge problem, not just in Mozambique, but a lot of places in Africa and um, in Southeast Asia as well as droughts become stronger and, and some of the floods become stronger as well, but it means, uh, uh, and actually, we saw this in Portugal just a few weeks ago, uh, where they were increasing production of almonds and avocados and wanted more water storage to make their um, irrigation more predictable. Um, so this is tricky. Um, we have, in many dam removal projects, built in in-stream water intakes. And I don't think we're perfect at it yet. Um, some work OK. One works for a uh, mill, which we saw in one of the pictures, the Great Works. That was a very expensive water intake, but it assured them that they would have pure uh, water coming into the mill for fabrication and, um, and cooling um, without clogging. <clears throat> and um, I'm not sure we can design those expensive types for all kinds of rivers. And to your point, in Mozambique, you might not, you might have dry seasons where you know, it's very difficult to maintain that water intake uh, while keeping ecological flows downstream because then you will impact downstream communities and that causes a lot of strife um, between parts of the community up and downstream as well as the ecological community. I don't have an answer um, except to say that, that these are uh, social and agricultural and ecological problems. And I'm sure uh, along the Mozambique, uh, I know along um, many of the large river systems, you know, these freshwater fisheries are crucially important for local subsistence uh, uh, foraging for, uh, for food. And so I think we need to take that into the equation as well as the impacts for agriculture and find other solutions, maybe with wells and other ways to ensure more reliable water sources for the food they need to grow. So not a great solution to that. I'm, I'm sorry for, uh, for not being able to get that, the whole problem and the whole solution. <laughs> but I love that you're working on it and, and thinking of those multiple aspects at the same time. We have to do that. We can't go in blindly. I'm going to follow up after this with a question to you about runoff attenuation features, which might be a, an, a, a, an 
an alternative. Uh, Sebastian yeah. Burke has a question. I did not fully understand the position of the Nature Conservancy in relation to the water agencies that might have an official role in water management. Are there NGOs facilitating a catchment approach that would not have been successful if leaving it to the official water management? That's a great question, and and I can't fully uh, I can't fully understand uh, can't fully explain our uh, what our goals are in the future. But we know we would like to bring information from our conservancy scientists around the world, as well as working with consortia like the Merlin Group to come up with better solutions for full catchment approach that would work with the basin management authorities. I think that's where the most um, fruitful and probably appropriate uh, path lies. And TNC um, in Europe is, is, is growing, but it's a small staff. And our relationship with the water agencies is, is merely as, um, as an advisor as anyone else would be an advisor to working with the EU um, or the water basin management authorities. What we are doing is figuring out which basins around uh, the continent are the highest priority for biodiversity and which of those are serving populations of people or could better with different nature-based solutions so that we can increase either the capacity of local NGOs there or to increase our capacity if that's an option in order to implement better catchment approaches there. So um, I think uh, it's also something that the Open Rivers Program is looking at is trying to prioritize where to double down, where are there biodiversity um, imperatives and where are their partners that are capable to help work on those and, and what do they need to be more functional so um, yeah that's that's a, a, sh a short think, answer to a complex and growing growing situation with the nature conservancy in Europe I think we have uh, time for one last question here uh, is it possible to link coastal communities with inland communities if improved riverine connectivity and habitat translates to improved marine fisheries? The answer is yes, and it takes work and education and it takes finding local champions. Um, and uh, it's nice when you've got money involved. For us, <clears throat> it didn't take much to get the coastal lobstermen. Again, the state of Maine's largest marine fishery is for lobster. And in the springtime, the lobster provides 50% of their bait. It is local. It works extremely well because these are fish that are laden with milk and eggs and, um, and it's nearby. Otherwise, in other years, they're importing frozen fish from far as away as Alaska and Australia to bring to put in their traps for lobster. So once they understand the economics involved that they could do it themselves, that they and their, some buddies could go up and buy a permit to harvest in an inland community. Um, they were very connected. What we haven't connected fully yet is the impact of those billions of juvenile fish coming into the Gulf of Maine, how that affects the commercial ground fishery for cod, hake, halibut, those other commercially important marine fish. But we're seeing the impacts starting. We just haven't gotten the right study to do the stomach content analysis to figure out how those freshwater fish are changing the fitness of the marine fish and therefore their reproduction and therefore producing more marine fish for coastal communities. So I think they understand it. Uh, it's, a, it's a nice, simple ecological connection um, that, um, that's easy to relate, um, but there do, there do need to be local examples of people making money and making those connections to spread among their commun community. So peer-to-peer -peer learning is really important. Well, uh, we are At very time. grateful. We, yeah, we are actually, as the, we would say here in Central Europe, Pünktlichkeit is alles, you know, punctuality is everything. And we are just on time. Uh, so I would first like to thank you for a very clear presentation, everyone for submitting excellent questions and very concise answers. I think the recording of this will be very valuable uh, for people over time. Um, I would like to uh, give everyone a, a preview that uh, we will not have another webinar till the 5th of September. And the, uh, it looks like an excellent lineup. Charles Van Rees will be talking about holistic monitoring. 
monitoring. Martin Kernan will talk about 10 years of nature-based solutions in river restoration using sustainable uh, process-based approaches. Paul Jepson will be talking about rewilding. Shane McGuinness will be introducing the wetlands project and Dominic Henry Zack toward the understanding of the implications of five peatland restoration strategies in Europe. I'm coming to doubt that that's actually one meeting. I think someone gave me a, uh, a link for a number of our webinars coming up. Uh, anyway, it looks like starting in the fall, there will be a lot uh, for us to see. So um, we will, uh, everyone within the Merlin project, of course, can see this as a recording. Um, and I believe if there are any follow-up questions, uh, please send it to us uh, by email. We'll do our best to respond. So once again, thank you, everyone. And uh, since everyone is going to regenerate for more a month in holidays, we all wish you a, a great, um, great summer holiday. Uh, Jürgen, Astrid, is there, did I leave anything out? No, all fine. So the, the webinars are one uh, one person per um, month. So the, the those that you announced are the next six months, uh, starting from September. Okay, so that was the hit parade I was announcing that it was coming. Okay, that's great. Um, well, if that's it, then everyone, thank you again for attending. A wonderful turnout, excellent questions and presentation, and we look forward to seeing you in September. <laughs>